perfect. Um, well, thank you very much for joining us online. It's a little bit loud here when I speak, but I think it's going to get better when you speak. Uh, well, we have uh, Professor Kevin Scannell, who's joining us from the US. We really hope that he could join us in person, but uh, logistic didn't allow, I think, on his side. Uh, but really, thank you very much for joining us online. Um, so, Kevin, you've got 20 minutes, then we'll have five minutes for questions and answers. That's great. Thank you. Um, and thanks very much for the invitation um, and for the opportunity to come and, and visit you all. Um, I want to talk about grammatical error correction. Actually, before I start, I wanted to give a quick shout out. I saw Kieran um, O'Devine is, is online. Kieran is uh, um, one of the people who was really the first, I think, to be doing corpus linguistics on uh, Celtic languages. So I'm really happy that uh, that he's with us online. Um, I want to talk about grammatical error correction, um, which is a very narrow topic. Michal did a good job introducing the Irish situation as a whole. Um, even though this is maybe a very narrow talk, it, lurking behind what I'm going to talk about is are kind of my thoughts on um, how we should be doing NLP for the Celtic languages um, in the context of a world of large language models and um, how we can overcome the fact that we're never going to have the, the two million or two billion words that uh, Dave Howcroft um, referenced for, for true large language models. How do we overcome that? Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, synthetic training data, and I'm going to talk a bit about how to incorporate, how I'm incorporating um, linguistic knowledge into my models. Uh, so the problem of grammatical error correction um, takes a sentence and then ideally outputs that sentence again with errors corrected. So it's sort of a translation problem. Um, there's the easier problem of just detecting the errors where you put a, a little squiggle under the incorrect words. Um, what I'm really interested in and what I think the Irish language community wants um, is the harder problem of detecting the errors and possibly correcting them, but also giving an explanation um, and saying why in this particular context this is right or wrong. Um, and that's that's really what my aim has been um, over the last two years. Most of the research on this problem is on English. Um, but there are small data sets for, for training um, grammatical error correction systems for about 20 languages. Um, and this is a truly difficult task, even in the context of large language models where the state of the art scores are only in the say 50s or 60s, um, if you know about F scores. Uh, fortunately, Irish and probably the other Celtic languages um, is easier not because of any particular um, <laughs> skills or talents of my own, but just because most of the errors that people make involve spelling and mutation errors, and those are detectable in through sort of local context. Uh, and that makes the, the problem easier. The other big issue to overcome here is what is correct Irish? Um, this is a very fraught uh, question. Uh, we do have an official standard. The original standard was published in 1958. It was revised again uh, about 10 years ago, and then once again, seven years ago, um, which is the current standard. Um, the standard, people write in st standard Irish um, almost all the time. So every newspaper book and so on, it's um, used uniformly. Um, um, except for the fact that even individuals, when they're sort of writing more or less standard Irish, nobody sticks with the standard um, spelling and rules 100% of the time. There are dialect variations, uh, just personal variations that people use. Um, and then some of the rules are obscure enough that nobody really knows all of them. Um, even more problematic is the fact that the existing grammars textbooks and even the, the, the dictionaries do not fully align with the, the text of the official standard. I'll give an example in a second. Um, and even if you read the standard very carefully, not all the rules are fully spelled out as sort of thinking like a computer scientist. Um, so there's some interpretation there and you can even argue over what the, the correct interpretations are. And what this means is that if you're trying to get um, training data from uh, a big corpus, from crawling the web, for example, 
Um, there's very little text that you can reliably say this is completely compliant with any version of the standard. So here's an example. I usually give this for um, talks with Irish speakers to try and start uh, fights. So this is the phrase meaning um, freedom of speech. You can ask whether um, the second word should have a mutation or not. Um, I don't know how many Irish speakers are there, but you can discuss among yourselves. If you ask the corpus, I have a, a largest corpus of web crawl text here on my computer, and I looked and the vast majority seem to prefer the unmutated uh, second word. Um, you can look at similar examples of freedom of religion, same sort of variation, mutated or not mutated. Um, it's a closer call there, but um, again, the unmutated form is the favorite. Um, if you look in the dictionaries, there it's sort of a mixed bag. You'll find, so on the left is the standard uh, Irish English dictionary that goes back to 1977. Um, and you'll see what freedom of religion with the mutation and freedom of speech without. Uh, the new English Irish dictionary has um, a mix of both. Um, this is to say that, in short, the dictionaries um, are either interpreting the rules differently um, or they're giving sort of inconsistent advice um, to, to uh, the Irish language community. So one of the things I did um, about five years ago was I tried to train a system to do this um, without worrying about the explanation. So this is a completely unsupervised system uh, trained just on raw text. Um, instead of worrying about grammatical errors in general, I focused just on correcting initial mutations um, and formulated it as a tagging problem. So there are more or less five different possible mutations assigned each of those a tag. Uh, the good news, so for Welsh speakers, um, Irish orthography is completely transparent in the sense that if I look at a word, I can tell you um, whether it has a mutation, which one, and what the base word is with no ambiguity at all. Um, this is unlike, as I understand it, Welsh, um, Breton, Manx is the same way. It's not uh, transparent. Um, Gaelic is transparent. So that's good news. <clears throat> what it means is that I can get very reliable um, training data for this unsupervised problem just from raw text. Um, this, <clears throat> as an older system, I used um, uh, these recurrent layers to train a model. It's got character level information as well to give you information about um, the spelling of words, which is sometimes uh, informative for this problem. Um, and it achieved very high levels of accuracy as just a tagging problem. Uh, the character component where you're looking at the spelling of words gives you information about, um, for example, certain words look, certain nouns look masculine or feminine. I assume that's true in Welsh as well. Um, and that would, um, even if it's a word that's never been seen in training, that can give you information about what the right mutation is. Um, and then the word base component can learn um, subtle cues from broader context. The problem with this approach is that uh, number one, you're learning from um, you know raw text from the web. It might have nothing to do with the official standard, um, and include lots of errors and text written by learners. Um, as always with neural networks, it can make mistakes that are difficult to debug or really interpret at all. Um, and then I think most this ties in with the first thing, but but most problematic is that they. Easy things are easy, and then the, the, the cases that are difficult for humans um, are difficult for the neural network as well. Um, and the, the real problem that I want to address is that it, it does nothing. It, I develop a system. I can put a text in. It'll tell me which mutations are wrong. It'll tell me which, what the correct mutation should be, but it doesn't tell the user why. For an advanced <coughs> speaker of the language, that's fine. <coughs> but for a learner, um, that doesn't do the trick. So the challenge here is to do something similar, but to try and get the explanations back. Um, <clears throat> so what I did is I'm still treating it as a tagging problem, but now with a rich, a richer set of tags. So the enhanced set of tags simply appends literally the section number of the official standard uh, to the original tag. Um, 
with the section of the standard that explains why that mutation is the correct one. Um, so this seems may seem a little hacky, but um, I expand a, ta a tag set with five tags to now a tag set with several hundred tags. Fine. If you believe that I could tag text correctly with this tag set, then this essentially solves the problem. What it leaves us is the, is the, 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 the challenge of producing the training data because we can't use unsupervised training anymore. We need to actually have tagged text in order to do this. So how can we produce millions of examples of uh, text which where the mutations are correctly tagged by the correct section of the official standard? And that is the problem that I left myself. Um, I should say I also saw that um, my my Wikipedia colleagues, Robin and Amy, are online. I'll say that the first thing that I tried for this was to um, to look at Wikipedia error logs. Um, you can look at the change logs from every version of every page change on Wikipedia and extracted a really interesting data set of more than 100,000 spelling and error corrections that appear on Wikipedia. Um, the, it's really useful. The problem is it's actually not enough to, to solve uh, the problem at hand. So um, if others are interested in that approach, I'm happy to, to share what I've done on that. What, what I ended up doing is to turn to the universal dependencies uh, tree bank. So this is um, originally created by Teresa Lynn for, for Irish. Um, it's a framework, it's a multilingual framework for doing dependency parsing in, in many languages in kind of a language independent way. Um, so, and this is a, a, an example sentence from one of Teresa and Jennifer Foster's papers. So without getting too much into the weeds on, on universal dependencies, um, I want to point out one thing. So this is it's more or less, a, this is a universal dependencies parse in the actual format that the, that the corpus is delivered. Um, first column is the surface token and then a lemma, part of speech tag. Um, and then what comes next is uh, key value pairs, which are features. So you have, you know, tenses, uh, number, person, gender for nouns, et cetera. Um, the form or the mutation is also one of those features. Um, as it happened, what I had done as part of a sort of QA process for Teresa's tree bank was to develop a suite of Python tools that essentially predict those um, feature values based on the dependency relations. So that code is up online and open source. You can have a look. Um, and it's, it's implemented in terms of constraints. So you're saying things like if, if, a, if a token is an adjective and it follows a feminine noun, et cetera, under certain constraints, and it should have the uh, form equals lenition uh, uh, feature value. Um, and essentially implemented that for all of the possible features and all of the possible feature values. Um, so that was a good bit of, bit of work. It was done originally to as this um, QA tool, um, <clears throat> but it turned out to be really useful um, for the problem at hand. So it was sort of good, good fortune and good synergy in a sense. Um, so I refactored the code essentially to parallel the rules as they appear in the official standard. Um, and I have a sort of screenshot here. So I call this the, the electronic standard. So the, it's literally a translation of the text standard, which you see on the right, a sort of screenshot of the PDF. Uh, turned into Python code. Um, the Python code is slightly shorter, but I think only because um, I don't include the example sentences. Um, and it's it's possible to sort of shift some things into uh, separate functions. Um, but this very clean mapping from the sections of the standard into um, these constraints. So what does that allow us to do? Again, it was originally to improve the Irish tree bank. That has the knock-on effect that it improves the parsers and taggers, which we've been using, as Michal talked about, for the uh, big corpus project. Um, what I've been working on the last few months is to actually use this tool, apply it to the output of the parsers and taggers to, again, improve the um, quality of tagging um, after the fact. Um, um, you've improved it in training, but then you're also improving after the fact. Um, 
I'll show you a slide in a second, which um, exhibits um, sort of a survey, which I think is the first ever survey at a corpus level of the extent to which Irish speakers follow the standard um, broken down more or less rule by rule in the standard. Um, what I've used it for here in the context of grammatical error correction is to produce the generic or the, the synthetic training data that I need for the approach that I described earlier. So here's the corpus level survey of errors. Um, Again, on the first column, these are the actual sections of the of the standard expressed as the constraints in my system. Um, I've given sample errors um, of the appropriate type, and then um, the percent of the time in the corpus that I looked at um, where Irish speakers um, used or did not follow the advice of the standard. Um, and some of them were just because the rules are more or less obscure. Um, and others are just sort of legitimate mistakes that you see people make online. So how do I produce the synthetic training data? Uh, I take the sentences of a large corpus. I run them through the dependency parser um, trained on Teresa's corpus. Um, this is the this is a tricky bit. So I take um, um, tokens where there are incorrectly predicted features according to my scripts, and I ignore those. So this is a way of ignoring sentences in the training corpus that are already erroneous. Um, so what I like to do is I'd like to keep um, the, the sentences or even the tokens that are used correctly, at least according to my scripts. <clears throat> um, it also has the effect that it allows you to ignore mistakes that the um, uh, that the parser makes um, when it's not perfect. And then each remaining token is attached to one or more constraints by my Python scripts. Um, and then I intentional constraints by simply changing the mutations and adding the appropriate tag. So in a sentence like uh, the woman is singing, um, the woman should have a um, Linishin mutation, um, and I know that because of section 10.2.1 of the standard, and I violate that in two possible different ways, by either removing it or changing it to the incorrect mutation, um, and then tagging those appropriately. I then have as more or less as many trainings as I want. I have millions and millions of tagged sentences with errors I flag according to the appropriate section of the standard, um, and then um, train a large language model to solve this tagging problem. Um, and this has turned out to be an effective approach. I still don't have the um, the system implemented online, so it's not I'm not able to make it available to everybody for testing at this point, but I hope to do that soon. Um, in terms of future directions, just to finish up quickly, um, the this is a neat way of handling the issue of learner text, non-standard text, dialect text that appear in training examples um, by restricting at least according to my scripts to the uh, the tokens of the context that appear to be compliant. Uh, the advantage is, is oversampling. So I talked about these rarer contexts where it's harder for the neural network um, to get the right answer just because they are they appear so infrequently in training. Um, you can simply oversample and generate more training examples of those types um, in order to get better performance. <clears throat> The big win is that with the uh, 2019 system, I restricted only to the initial mutations, which is effectively the form feature in UD. Um, this framework for grammar checking works with any of the UD features. So um, check with for errors with number, person, genders of adjectives, nouns, um, tenses of verbs, and so on and so forth. Um, and Presumably, all of the Celtic languages have tree banks except for Cornish, 
at this point, as far as I know, Cornish doesn't have one. Um, the approach or the general framework should apply neatly to the other four Celtic languages. And that's all I have, Gurmagi. Thank you very much. Okay, we've got some time for questions. Does anyone have any question? All right, uh, well, thank you very much for the talk. This is really interesting. So my question is about, in, in the talk you talked about like ignoring um, kind of like tokens that do not kind of follow the standard. But was, uh, my question would be like, don't language model use or do something similar to that? Like usually they would still kind of like understand because recently there has been talk uh, sorry work about like how could language models still help people with kind of like dyslexia and also like as I, I forgot the other one but it's when you try to say something but some words are missing it will still be able to like confirm to that so how would that work in case of language models sorry for the long question <laughs> no it's fine um and that's it's an important question um uh, one of the issues is that there are examples where um, the the standard goes against what the vast majority of people who are writing Irish online actually do. Um, so the the freedom of speech example is 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 a good one. Um, there, there's some wiggle room and and question about how you interpret the standard as to what the correct answer is uh, for how to write that. But there there are many examples where if you train a language model that and then ask it to predict what the right mutation is without doing any filtering the sort of majority or democratic democratically trained system will always give you the wrong answer in terms of the standard so that's really where the the challenge comes in thank you very much any other questions from the audience or online All right um yeah sure Hi, Kevin. Good to see you. Um, it's Griff from Banga here. Um, how scalable is this approach to other kinds of errors? Um, for instance, maybe ang uh, maybe English patterns coming through in your language, or would you are you too dependent on having um, the 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 corpus of errors to be able to look at those kinds of of issues? Oh, this is a great question. Yeah. So, and this is something that's, it's problematic with the field as a whole, because the field is driven by the training data that people use, and nobody really agrees on what er grammatical error correction means, right? So, and for Irish speakers as well, I think we'd be very interested in tools where, yeah, maybe is this an anglicism, right? Or is this, um, is there is there sort of a more natural way of saying something in Irish that you might view as a, a sort of incorrect Irish? Um, this approach would not handle those kind of purely semantic things. Um, it's by the very, by the way that I formulated it, um, it's only going to catch things that are expressed either in dependency relations, part of speech tags or features in UD. Um, now that's a wide variety of things, but if somebody writes something which is just semantically weird and wrong, or they misuse a word, um, um, maybe under the influence of English, um, there's no way that the system can, can, can catch that if otherwise the gr grammar of the sentence is completely correct. Makes sense. Okay, one last question, so Paul Rayson. Thanks, Kevin. So, yeah, I was wondering about whether your system could be kind of turned the other way around so you can use it to detect where the standard needs to be updated in a way. You're finding plenty of examples where the standard is being broken, so therefore you need to update it. Yeah, you faded out for a second. I caught the, the last little bit about whether the standard is broken and you should update it. So I assume that I have the question correct. And uh, yes, I'm very interested in this. Um, I The standard is set to be revised and at least reviewed, I, th I think they said every seven years or every 10 years or something like that. Um, uh, I, I, I think it would be important at the next 
extra vision to incorporate this sort of information. I think that's already being done at an informal level um, in the sense that, um, you know, the, the language experts who have their kind of pulse on the Irish language community it, at sort of an informal level take that into account as they revise the standard. And that was the motivation for a lot of the changes that actually occurred. Uh, but nothing was done, as far as I know, at a um, at a corpus level. So so absolutely, I'm interested in um, uh, contributing to that effort when it rolls around again um, uh, the next few years. That's great. Uh, one more time, thank you very much for your time and for the presentation. Cheers.